Folks, welcome. Tonight we are going to have an interview with the two gentlemen who are responsible for bringing us this fine new game, Assault on Gallipoli, from our good friends at Hexasim and Gecko Games. I think we're going to ask about that. So say hi to Russell and Kieran. It is Kieran, right? Am I getting that right? That's right, right. yeah. Kieran. Okay, awesome. And obviously, since you guys are, obviously folks could tell, you're from Australia, um, and this is a topic that is very important to Australia. So normally, if this, you were Americans, I would ask you why you decided to design the game on Gallipoli, um, confounding all the Australians. But but tell us a little bit, for those who might not know, just what kind of impact this campaign and these events had down there. Well, basically, it's kind of um, Australia's most important battle, like our, our first major military engagement. Uh, we were involved in a Boer War, sort of mm -hmm. around 1899-1900, but the first time we we sent troops as an independent country was um, to Gallipoli, and they're actually the soldiers were meant to fight the Germans on the Western Front, but then Churchill decided to reroute the soldiers to attack the Ottomans in uh, in the Dardanelles, so it was kind of our first major military engagement, um, and you know it was very influential for lots of reasons. Um, but um, yeah, that was the main reason I decided to, to create the game was to, you know, not many games have actually covered that campaign. I know there's the GMT one, but mm -hmm. that didn't really get that much traction. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted something a bit simpler and easier to play with a sort of a broader appeal. So yeah, that's basically why I decided to, to create the game. I've only just started realize... glancing at it, but it looks pretty yeah. slick so far. Russell, you were going to add. What, what you've got to realize is Australians, we not celebrate, but we remember our defeats. Anzac Day in Australia is very important. And Australians have been in many victorious battles, Trebrook, World War I, World War II. There are quite a number of them. But unlike Americans, we don't celebrate our victories. We remember our defeats. And that's an important part of our culture. Yeah, that's an important point because um, the sort of most sacred day in the Australian calendar is Anzac Day, which is the 25th of April. And that is to uh, remember the landing of the, the troops on the 25th of April. So, um, you know, it's still in the collective consciousness of Australia and New Zealand. Um, and we remember it every year. And it's I guess it's symbolic of of all our um, soldiers, you know, men and women that have, that have fought in wars, um, you know, over the last century or so. Um, uh, yeah, so it's really important for us. So in American terms, it's kind of like our Veterans Day, Memorial Day, and maybe a little bit of Fourth of July thrown in for good measure. Yeah, yeah. that's it. So let's let's talk about sort of the mechanical foundations of the game. What was the kind of mechanical approach you took? You said you wanted to be uh, a little more accessible than Gallipoli in 1915, which I think it's fair. To, I've got that. I actually think it's a pretty cool game, but yeah. uh, it, it's maybe a little difficult to approach. How did you uh, tackle that? Challenge. Yeah, we, we know we know Jeffrey Phipps. Um, you know, he lives in Seattle. And Jeff's great. Um, I've had Jeff. He's a on good the guy. Show. Yeah, he's a really good guy. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, no. Look, I, I, I guess the the main reason I created the game was because um, you know I grew up in the 1980s playing a lot of Avalon Hill games. Um, you know, things like I don't know Gettysburg and Squad Leader and mm -hmm. and and Victory in the Pacific. Um, and I was kind of frustrated that there were no games that covered Australian military history. Uh, and um, well, actually, Victory in the Pacific which I have here, is one of the few games that actually has Australian units in it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's got the HMA as Canberra and, and the Australia in it. So I was really happy to play that uh, with my brother back in the 80s. Um, so anyway, I thought, well, why don't I create a, a system uh, that, that covers Australia's three most famous battles, which would be Gallipoli, um, uh, Tobruk and Kokoda. Uh, so I created this very simple system, basically educational, um, designed for school kids that was kind of based on Stratego, you know, using those um, uh, square grids and hidden movement and so on. Uh, and then um, I worked on those for about a year and I, I, I had a meeting with the head of the Australian Army. Uh, she was like the marketing manager. Um, and I was trying to get funding from the Australian Army. I was like, okay, you know, surely you guys would be interested in, the, in this, you know, to help educate your officers or whatever. Worst they um, could say is no. It, well, yeah. Well, anyway, she she was actually really nice about it. We had a meeting in Canberra, um, and I took my wife, who was very supportive. Um, but at the end of the day, they, were, they they liked the idea, but they didn't actually fund it, so it was kind of a bit pointless. And then and then I put the those games on Kickstarter back in 2018, and that failed as well. So at that stage, I was kind of like, um, well, I'm just going to drop it and forget it altogether. 
But then I, I played... saw those. I saw those Kickstarters while I was in the U.S. in Seattle. Yeah. And when I came home to Australia, it turned out that my brother and a friend from high school knew Kieran very well. Yeah, and then and then I sort of basically gave up on it, and I thought, well, I'm just going to go back to enjoying games, you know, because game design obviously is is quite difficult, and it's a, it's a long process. Um, anyway, I played this. Storm but, over but Stalingrad. what do you do with all the money that you got from <laughs> designing right. games? Storm over Stalingrad, I played, and and um, that to me. Uh, you know, it got me thinking that I could probably use that sort of s similar system to do something like Kokoda and Gallipoli. Um, you know, it's very approachable, the area movement, um, the the impulse activation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's never any downtime. You're constantly thinking. You don't have to wait for the other player to have their turn. You can just, you know, they, they do round, then you do one. So, yeah, and, and I use that something similar to, to Storm over Stalingrad for, for the Gallipoli game. But... The thing that struck me about the storm over Arnhem and Stalingrad system is um, every time you you fire your units, you're doing a kind of an equation. Mm -hmm. You know, you work out your firepower factor um, uh, plus two dice, and then you minus their defensive factor plus two dice, and then you've got to work out an equation each time. The difference is how much damage is done to the defending units. So it's kind of it's it's a bit like a maths lesson really you know um so i wanted something simpler so we used a kind of a bucket of dice approach where you need a, a four to hit you know and it's modified by terrain or whatever like flames of war um mm -hmm. you know the mini sort of game it just makes it a lot easier it's more intuitive um you don't need to check any tables um and it's more fun you know and i think obviously people prefer throwing buckets of dice you know when they can it's just it's just nice and easy just go for it mm -hmm. you know um, we need to have this Ah. which is a good example of what not to do. Yeah. Um, but it does have interesting things there with Cape Palace in there and the Dardanelles. And there's still content in here that would be interesting in terms of if we ever did an expansion focusing on uh, Cape Palace or putting the Dardanelles into, into the picture. Mm -hmm. That's and true. That, yeah, that's a traditional hex and counter game. And it, mm -hmm. it is good, but it's it's very simplistic again, you know, I mean, we spent a long time doing the research on all of the units, um, you know, and we made sure that, um, uh, you know, we, we factored in all the leaders. We, we did all the biography checks on leaders and who was good and who wasn't so good. And, you know, so it took us a long time. I did 20 versions of the map to get it right because uh, the, the map, the landscape is just a nightmare. It's um, sort of heavily eroded hills, um, you know, that... that um, gullies everywhere, hidden gullies all over the place, just a mad sort of landscape. And they didn't even intend to land there. They actually intended to land about a mile south in, in the plains and just mm. move across the plain. But they, for, for whatever reason, you know, they drifted north about a mile uh, and they landed at this really hilly, rocky landscape and were constantly fighting uphill. So, you know. So anyway, um, I came back from the US and just knew Kieran through associates, people I knew, people from high school, and my brother even, and um, we started wargaming again. And one day, Kieran comes in and he starts saying he wants to rework Gallipoli, give it another crack. And so we started looking at the systems and starting to rework everything. Um, and now, I'm a games developer for computer games. Um, and back in the 90s, I had a string of hits. One of them is Galactic Frontiers, which was an early computer game for Macintosh. So any old guys out there who had the Macintosh back in the 90s, um, there's a link to it there. I just put it in the in the chat. The um, I will make sure that gets put in the video description. Very good. Um, so out of high school, I did Galactic Frontiers and another game called Jewels of the Oracle, um, which is this one here. Hmm. And then um, following that, I actually had a spelling game which was sold into Texas called Spelling Spree. Hmm. And um, that actually burnt me out. And then I finally went and got a degree. But um, when I came out of doing a degree, the computer game industry had gotten so much larger. Um, I eventually ended up working for Disney Interactive in Seattle. Hmm. But at that point, you're just a small cog in this massive machinery. You, you can't write computer games anymore with a team of only five or six people. You know, it's a whole army of people. People working in the movie industry say much the same thing. You get lost in the crowd. And when I came back to Australia, Kieran starts digging around with Gallipoli again. And I'm like, all right, well, let's see if we can make this thing work. 
Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is, um, well, Kieran and I, when we were younger, we played a lot of SPI games, a lot of Avalon Hill games. As I said, my brother knows Kieran from the Wargaming Group, I and mean, we were exposed to all these same things. Um, for me, the first game I ever bought was War of oh, the Ring. Very nice. Yeah, it's a good game. Uh, Richard Bowers. I, just, mm -hmm. I destroyed this game as a yeah. kid. I love this game. And then you've got these SPI-style simulations, probably mm -hmm. one of the best is, of course, Empires of the Middle Ages. But the point I'm trying to make now is um, the lesson of SPI, which was really simulations, um, these games, um, they had this um, sort of thing. SPI goes all the way to the campaign for North Africa, where they were going for these really deep and complicated games that were simulations. But when you play Avalon Hill games and things like Diplomacy and things like um, Axis and Allies even, these things are broader games. And the lesson for me, at least in that period of time, was the deeper and more frag more complicated the system, the more fragile it becomes. So if you have SBI churn these things out, and if you create a deep system trying to be a simulation, you create uh, a situation which is more likely to contain loopholes that the players can exploit. So the irony was at the time, everybody was playing Third Reich, but we know from the history of the thing, Axis and Allies in the long term was the game that would win out through a broader system that is more general. And the irony is that simplicity, the simpler systems that are broader are more robust, less likely to break. And the irony is, is they can feel more realistic or at least more playable. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that to me is an important part of the history of the things. So when Kira and I were working on this, we were trying to move away from the tables, the world in flames, and to put in more mm. like the flames of war, buckets of dice. And, and at, the end of, at the end of the day, they're all abstractions in one way or the other, right? I mean, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what system you use or how realistic you think it is. You're still playing with, you know, cardboard chits and, and mm. counters and boards and whatever. So you're abstracting it no matter what you do. But I, I agree with Russell, you know, if you if you focus too much on the actual, um, my, you know, the details, the finer details and not the overall feel of the battle and the, you know, the key points, then you, you get lost in those details and it's actually not fun to play. You, you might as well just be reading a book about it or, you know, because it's all scripted. It's like you can't change history. You have to basically play because, you know, everything, the, the scenarios aren't balanced, for example, you know, you know, you're going to lose if you play the Germans or the Russians. So what's the point of playing? Uh, you don't want that in a game, you know. A lot of it was about simplifying and simplifying mm. systems. And there was a granularity issue. D6s aren't high enough granularity. And so we introduced D10s. And then there's also the same thing that Columbia Games found, where with D6s, if you want to roll high, the system works better if you have start the low value and if you want to increase the chances, you, you give bonuses. But that means the numbers start low and go up as opposed to high and come down. What I'm saying with this is you end up with a system where low rolls are good. And that's just naturally how it irons out when you look at the mathematics behind it. Mm -hmm. Columbia Games found this with 1812 and Caesar. Um, the first version of 1812 that was printed Sixes are good, sixes are highs, but they realized later on that they reworked it so ones are good, twos are good, because it just naturally works out that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the, the sort of roll high versus roll low, I mean, we could probably talk for half an hour on that. Uh, I, I, you know, you can make either approach work fundamentally, but uh, I, I'm well, interested... Squad yeah. leader was the same. Squad leader, yeah. low is good. Mm -hmm. You know, you roll snake eyes and you've got the KIA, right? Mm -hmm. And if there's a <laughs> universally known game in the hobby, it's, that's one of them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The, where I'm going with this is if you want to make something easier to hit, you naturally want to give it a bonus, a plus one. Mm. So if you've, got a, if you've got a base of four, plus one will be five, plus two will be six. The trouble is if you want roll high to work, then to make it easier, you get you would have to give negatives. 
Mm-hmm. And that just sounds wrong when you're writing rules, when you're trying to explain it to somebody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that means low rule, low rolls become good. I don't like that. I'm a high roller. Mm-hmm. But it naturally works out in terms of mechanics. And Columbia Games, I think, were the first people to discover this. Mm-hmm. Well, they were first on the scene for a number of things, to, to be honest. True. Uh, I am. I have a preference for roll high myself. I think it's more intuitive. So yes, um, I, I do too. But the maths doesn't work out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it it's it's a really powerful tool to be able to to do that though, right? To say, you know what? Let's just make it roll low, and then all these other things are now more intuitive. Even though I'm rolling low, and low is better, right? It's yeah. A, it's a trade off that needs to be made. The, the movement towards using D10 is, is becoming popular as well, you know, mm-hmm. with games like Undaunted um, and mm-hmm. so on. It, it's just such a, it, it's a more logical system because it's, you know, it's decimal, it's 10. And you can say, okay, I've got a 40% chance of hit, uh, to hit, mm-hmm. I, you know, I need a four, it's 40%. Um, it's it's just so much more logical and simple than the, you know, 16 point whatever percent it is for a D6. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so, so we're really happy with using the D10. Uh, as Russell said, it gives you more granularity, so you can just have these incremental minuses and pluses. Um, so I think that's a general trend in wargaming as well, moving towards the D10. Mm-hmm. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that th- that this latest edition from Hexasim is the game's second edition, the original being put no. out by Gecko. Right. That's correct. Yeah. So about so whom I know absolutely nothing other than they're Australian. So please tell me. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, Gecko Games is basically me. Um, so okay. I, I I self published the the first edition. Okay. Um, and um, I don't know. I printed about a hundred copies. Um, and um, they they sold out really quickly. Mm-hmm. And I and I sent them out to um, you know, the Players Aid, uh, Stuka Joe, um, Wise Guy History. You know, all the sort of key players. Yeah. Um. And, um, you know, luckily they picked it up. Like, Stuka Joe did some really good um, mm-hmm. uh, replays and unboxings. And you, you, know. you don't really get low quality content out of Jose, do you? No, he's amazing. So, yeah, yeah, he was really good about it. Even mm-hmm. though it cost me almost two hundred dollars to post it to Puerto Rico, um, it was it was really good. Like he 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 was he's such a nice guy, and he does very comprehensive, um, you know, overviews and playthroughs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, yeah, the so, best uh, in our in our space. And I think so. He even animated, opinion. you know, he put yeah. explosions and things mm-hmm. on, and I was like, "Wow!" And, and people were commenting, "This is better than watching a movie," you know. So I was really happy about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, generally, we the industry has been supportive because you know we're kind of a new company, I guess. And Hexasim then picked up the game. Um, Hexasim in France picked up the game, and and they did the second edition. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, we're really happy with that, and uh, means the game is you know more available now. And um, they've posted a whole bunch uh, to GMT, so mm-hmm. the, you, it should be more easily available in the US very soon. Because I know it's still quite expensive there, um, but um, yeah, so we're very happy with with how it's turned out. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I mean, I ordered my first four Hexasim games from GMT directly because it yeah. never even occurred to me. Well, obviously, it's going to be less convenient to order them from France, right? Yeah. So, but actually. I, apparently, ordering directly from Hexasim in France, if you're in the U.S., is not that bad of a deal. It's not that I, expensive, no. I will, as an American, take the hit for the scandalous shipping costs to Puerto Rico. It, I mean, <laughs> I don't know why. It's yeah. it, it, it if it makes you feel any better, it yeah. would be ridiculously expensive for me to ship something to Joe from Ohio. Oh yeah, that makes no sense whatsoever. So I yeah. apologize on behalf of America. <laughs> That's right. But he, he seems to have kind of, uh, Stuka Joe has set up this, you know, ivory tower of wargaming. He's got this amazing <laughs> yeah, collection. It's and something else. There's like hurricanes and cyclones going on out there, and he's just in his bunker playing his war games. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, he's an amazing guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we all things, love Joe. Other things I thought I'd mention, um, uh, Hannibal mm-hmm. had this wonderful battle card system. Mm-hmm. Have you played Hannibal, haven't you? The, um, I have. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> well, yeah, the, there's uh, a lot of gaps in my education. Yeah, yeah. But I have played that. Not that one. The um, the and the the battle card system, I always thought was my favorite part of this game. When you get into into, into kind it. of a divisive opinion, some people disliked oh, yeah. the battle card yeah, system. Right. And now, when the um, when that game was first invented, the first version of it is We the People. Mm-hmm. 
and that's where the, those battle cards first came from. Mm -hmm. And then they were reused again in Hannibal, but when they redid We the People as Washington's War, they took those cards out. Uh, and there's lots of good arguments why. Mm -hmm. um, and it was inappropriate for those types of battles and they, these types of things. And I was always very upset by the removal of those cards because I felt it was really the cornerstone of Hannibal and it was one of the things I wanted to reintroduce to our game. So we did that. Yeah, well, and if... people love it. People love the battle cards, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it means that um, uh, at the end of every turn, you get these sort of climactic, um, epic close combats to see who's going to control the area. Um, mm -hmm. So it makes it, it definitely makes it more fun instead of just rolling dice. You know, you, you if you're lucky with your cards, you can actually win, um, a, you know, a battle that we, when against the odds, you can still win. Um, but yeah, we're happy with that. And for what it's worth, I liked the battle cards in, uh, hmm. in We the People and in. Uh, I should say in Hannibal because yeah. I have actually only played the the Washington's War version of that game. We've of course heard the story. Mark can hop in and correct me if he likes in the comments. Uh, you've heard, of course, Mark's. I think if I were calling it correctly, version of why those are in there was because so his wife would play it with him. Wow! So I didn't know that. No, I did not know that. I, I believe that is the story. Yeah. So well, they, they took they took him out. And there's very good arguments for why they took them out. Mm -hmm. um, but they did work very well in Hannibal, and the similar system works very well in Gallipoli for trench war. Mm -hmm. It gives a tenseness to it that um, Kira and I, well, a lot of people playing the game like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So the game itself does come with a deck, and then I think these red ones are the, the battle yep. cards. That's it, yeah. But to, uh, to clarify, the battle counts are really when the guys get into the trench. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's actual hand-to-hand yeah. -hand combat in the mm -hmm, trench. Yeah. And, and the thing is, we wanted to show, um, you know, the actual um, close-up, you know, horrible nature of World mm -hmm. War One brutality, you know, the, the bayonet charges and the, you know, the, the raids using those um, shovels, the sharpened shovels, you know, all that horrible stuff that... Most war, World War One war games don't show. They're very abstract. You know, things like Paths of Glory, where you just kind of got these giant armies or divisions. I'm not saying they're bad games, but but it doesn't really show the brutal nature of you know First World War combat. Um, so so we wanted to sort of you know drill down and show that, uh, which I think it, it it does to some extent. Um, I mean, obviously it's you know very removed from the brutality of it, but um, well, you do and we're all for thankful for that. Yeah, it's, exactly. <laughs> it, it is important to mention that um, that unlike Powers of Glory is a card-driven game. Mm -hmm. um, I think Zilla Blitz mentioned this, this is important. Uh, Assault on Gallipoli is not card-driven. The cards augment the gameplay. Um, yeah. The action cards do, but they're not. They don't drive the game like Powers of Glory. Uh, so I actually want to ask about the research that uh, that you did for the game. You said you'd done a bunch of research on the various units involved. And I'm yeah. curious because this is not an American topic, right? Yeah. If I want to research the Battle of the Bulge, I will have no shortage of American sources to look at. Please no more Bulge games. But No more Bulge and no more <laughs> Gettysburg games. There's just too many. <laughs> I will forward your request to Danny Parker. Um, but... I've got a bunch of them. I mean, I love them, but there's oh, just yeah. so many. It's like, you know. Well, there's a lot, but we keep yeah. buying them too. So, you know, I yeah. can't blame the publishers or the designers for that matter. But but yeah. the, the point is that what what kinds of uniquely Australian sources do you have for this battle? Uh, well, we, we have, um, you know, there, there were an official war correspondent was there, a guy called Charles Bean. Um, and he, you know, recorded everything every day, what happened at, uh, during the campaign, because it went for nine months. It, you know, it didn't happen quickly. And we picked scenarios from the key battles of that campaign, like the Battle of Lone Pine. And, you know, um, we didn't try and cover the whole nine month campaign. Uh, and each day is a turn. So each turn is a day. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we just picked out the key battles. But, um, yeah, in terms of research, I spent about a year reading all different books, you know, the Australian side, the New Zealand side, the Turks, um, you know, uh, the British side, the naval side. Um, and it's fascinating. They call mm -hmm. it the Gallipoli bug because once you get interested in it, you, you can't really stop reading about it. There's so many, there's so many what ifs. Um, the, the key one being that um, uh, the, the main Turkish commander, uh, Mustafa Kemal, mm -hmm. uh, who later became Turkey's first president, um, he was in command of the Turkish units, you know, facing the Anzacs. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and on the second day, he was hit by um, an artillery explosion um, and a piece of shrapnel uh, like hit him in the chest. And he had like a, um, a watch that protected him. Uh, almost like a kind of a you know a miracle or something, mm-hmm. um, and, and you know the the piece of shrapnel probably would have killed him or at least put him out of action, but but it had no effect on him. Had he died that day um, or been removed from the battle, then you know everything could have been quite different because he was the one that sort of really uh, masterminded the Turkish defence, mm-hmm. uh, and um, you know because the Australians had all the advantages really. It was a surprise landing, <laughs> except for the had, promised had the naval support. Landing. Exactly, they had the numbers, they had everything going for them. So they probably should have won, but for various reasons, they they didn't. And one of those was, you know, Mustafa Kemal being such a brilliant uh, tactical commander. And every time the Australians pushed in inland, he was there waiting with, you know, reinforcements. Um, and um, yeah, so if he wasn't there, it probably would have been quite different. Uh, if you ask any people in the US military, when I was living in the US, Americans would always say, oh, you're Australian uh Guys in Vietnam would say those Australians kept me alive when I was in Vietnam. I had lots of stories like that. The Australian military mm. has actually a very, very, very good reputation. And mm. um, to answer your question, the Australian War Memorial in Canberra has is, an, is a fantastic resource. And um, if you go there, they they have everything under the sun on Gallipoli, and they that is. That's the primary sources. The movie Gallipoli with Mel Gibson is great mm-hmm. as well. Uh, I think a lot of people have seen that. Um, mm-hmm. have, you, have you seen it? I have seen that. It's been a yeah. long time, but I have. Yeah, well, that's a great movie. Um, but that just focuses on on one particular aspect um, of the, you know, the Battle of the Neck. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's still a great movie, though, and a good introduction to the campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and for Americans especially, who will frankly be generally less familiar with this topic. Yeah, yeah, no, watch that movie. It's a, it's a great movie. And it, it, it's also, it's more than just about the Gallipoli, you know, campaign. It's also two great stories about two different men. And it's about the Australian Light Horse, who were like an elite unit of mm-hmm. cavalrymen, you know, or mounted infantrymen, um, who were forced to fight dismounted at, at Gallipoli. Um, but they had that famous sort of leather bandolier of uh, bullets and the little feather, the um, emu feather in their caps. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were kind of like elite soldiers, um, but they were reduced to, you know, trench warfare as well. Um, so um, so yeah. the Battle of the Neck, which is what you see at the end of Gallipoli, where they all get mowed down, that was the day after the Battle of Lone Pine or the beginning of Lone Pine. Lone Pine was the opposite. Uh, Lone Pine had seven Victoria Crosses awarded, and um, the uh, that was a very different story. Mm-hmm. But... Um, the neck is a horrific thing, as described mm. as one of the most bravest assaults in, in wartime. And they got it's a very out. narrow piece of land, you know. To, to give it context, the Australians are trying to get to the to the top of the of the mountain. Where it's kind of a you know about a thousand meters high, um, Chanak Bear. They were trying to reach that so that then they could uh, control basically the whole peninsula and and trap the Turks further south. Um, so the, the heights were the key locations, as they often are in, in you know, in most battles. Um, mm-hmm. And so the neck was this narrow piece of land that was only about as wide as a tennis court. Um, and, and that was controlling the access to the high ground. So um, the Turks first sent, they also struggled at the neck, you know, because we controlled the other end and, and they kept trying to take the neck, uh, you know, push us down from the neck. And then we captured it and then we were trying to push up from the neck. So it was a kind of a, you know, a give and take thing. Um and, and honestly, it was it was actually just it wasn't even the main battle. It was just a kind of a, a feint, a supporting attack for the for the New Zealand and Gurkha attack um, on the heights at Sari Sari Bear. That was the main thing. Uh, meanwhile, at mm-hmm. Lone Pine, uh, Leslie Moore's head is there at Lone Pine, and mm-hmm. that was conducted fabulously well. And Moore's head would go on to command at Trebrook in World War II and be the first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the rats of Trebrook to beat, to, to beat Rommel. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of generals, a lot of people in this conflict who would go on to become very important historically. Mm-hmm. To say nothing of Ataturk, right? If, you know, exactly. he, had, he had managed to bite it at Gallipoli. We would have a completely different history of Turkey. Absolutely. Yeah, he, he was very progressive. Um, you know, he, he, he gave women the right to vote in Turkey. Um, he, he changed the Turkish alphabet. They used to have like an Arabic script and mm-hmm. he went to the, you know, to the Latin alphabet. Um, he did all sorts of uh, things to modernize Turkey. So, yeah, he was a pretty amazing man. Not to say a great general as well. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly uh, distinguished himself at Gall in the Gallipoli campaign in particular. He did, yeah. And he didn't eat for days. If you look at photos of him, he was really thin. You know, he just, he didn't sleep for days. He was constantly standing, directing the troops. And, you know, he was a pretty amazing man. I will so layer in some photos of and, and or video into this interview uh, of mm -hmm. the game qu components themselves. Hexasim, predictably, has done a dynamite job producing really nice quality components. The cards feel really nice. It's got a beautiful mounted map. The counters are huge and thick and pre-rounded. I This is a very deluxe presentation. Now, Jose Faro was the primary artist. Am I right he, about that? Yes, that's correct. Uh, he did the map, um, mm -hmm. you know, based on my on my designs, and um, he also did the counters. He did a great job of the counters, mm -hmm. and yeah, he famously did. Um, uh, what's that um, sacrifice? What's it called? Three days of sacrifice. The the, the a most the, fearful the, sacrifice. Yes, yeah, he did the counters mm -hmm. for that. Hmm. So he's yeah. very in demand at the moment. He's he's really good. Um, you know, he's Spanish. He he lives in Seville. Mm -hmm. uh, he's mm -hmm. a great guy. Uh, yeah, I, I personally have never seen anything sloppy coming out of Hexasim anyway. So mm. one of the things I think it's important to add is that the New Zealanders play a prominent role in the game and in the fourth mm. scenario. New Zealanders will often get annoyed with Australians and we try to claim Anzac Day as our own, but the New Zealanders had an extremely important job. And Peter Jackson will tell you this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and his, his uncle was at, was at Gallipoli, I think. His great uncle mm. or something. He's obsessed with World War I, Peter Jackson. Mm -hmm. I'm aware when, of that. When New Zealanders of see the game, they feel mm. they get afraid that they're not going to have a, a mention in it. Well, the truth is the opposite. The, the best troops, well, yeah. the main troops in for the Anzacs are the New Zealanders. And uh, they are the ones who were sent to take Charlie Bear. And the fourth scenario is about really the New Zealanders. And I want to emphasize that for any mm. New Zealanders out there who see this, that you have not forgotten. Yeah, we're, we're trying to sell more games in New Zealand. We want more traction there. It's a difficult uh, market to crack. And also, um, you know, the postage in New Zealand is just crazy. It's because um, it's so far away from everywhere. Mm -hmm. it, even um, Australia, Americans don't realize how far away from each other that's, Australia that's right. and New Zealand are. They're like, oh, it's like in Indiana. It's like you can just drive there. No, no, you cannot. No, it is. It's a long way away. Beautiful country, though. Well, the, Peter Jackson can confirm that as well. Yeah. Yes. They had a very important role. And Malone got up to the heights and took it for how long, Kieran? Two days. Yeah, two days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a very close uh, close call, that one. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, so we've also, you know, Russell and I have been working on um, a, a sequel. Well, two sequels, really. But we've been busy doing Assault on Kokoda. Um, you know, which is the um, famous campaign where the Japanese tried to cross the Owen Stanley Ranges to capture Port Moresby mm -hmm. in 1942. Um, so we've been working on that for over a year now. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping to have that. I mean, we're, we're doing playtesting and so on, but that'll be similar, very similar to Gallipoli, um, but um, similar system. But we've, you know, adjusted it to, to make it more uh, interesting and, and, you know, supply driven uh, as, as, the, as it was. Um, mm -hmm. I should have done yeah. that 20 minutes ago. Yeah. The, um, but, but anyway, yeah, so we've been excited about that. And we don't have a publishing deal, you know, yet on that game. I was about but, to ask. Yeah, but, but um, you know, we. I think that some, hopefully someone will publish it uh, because I think it's going to be a really great game. And um, that's also a famous Australian campaign where Australia was almost invaded by the Japanese, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, we had Japanese submarines in Sydney Harbour. Um, Darwin was bombed, you know, by the same uh, fleet that bombed Pearl Harbor. You know, they they sailed down south and then bombed Darwin. So, um, you know, we were Australia was at risk in 1942, and you know, I think Kokoda will have a broader appeal, especially in Australia, because people still remember that that campaign, and mm -hmm. you know, there's still veterans that are alive from from that era. Um, so, yeah, so we're excited about that, and to Brook probably a bit further down the track, but. Um, so many people have done Tobruk already, um, you, you know, and done it well, right? So, mm -hmm. um, Tobruk is uh, like our Gettysburg. Everybody that writes Tobruk, the, the rats of Tobruk, you, you know. Um, but but our game is a little bit unique in the sense that it also covers the Australian attack on the Italians, you know, mm -hmm. 1941 when the Italians controlled uh, Tobruk, mm -hmm. uh, and the Australians took it in like two days. Uh, and then we also then we then we pivot and do the Rommel's attack on the Australians, um, you know, at a, sort of a company level. Um, using the impulse system, so so you know quite quite detailed in that sense, but 
you know, you've got Rommel's Panzers and so on. Um, the Germans were heavily outnumbered and yet they still attacked. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and the Japanese were the same. They often were outnumbered in the Pacific yet they still attacked, uh, you know, so they probably were never going to win, to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, we could yeah. have a whole conversation about that too. I, I know. I, know. I, yeah. I am inclined to agree with you, however. Yeah. In, in both cases, really. Yeah. The game looks really, really dynamite. And I, I certainly hope that uh, maybe the folks at Hexaseb will make it easy for you and just publish the other two themselves, right? That'd that be would, nice, yeah. That would simplify things. And, <laughs> well, you, you know, so. we, you, nobody's going to complain about their production standards either. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for doing this for us tonight. And everybody out there tonight watching, thanks for watching. Thanks for having us on the show. Massive thanks to the patrons of Ardwolf Slayer, whose support and encouragement make what we do at Ardwolf Slayer possible. Thank you, patrons. Links to help support the channel are in the video description, so check out the Patreon, the Ko-Fi, and the merch store, where you can get snazzy Ardwolf Slayer t-shirts, drinking vessels, and other cool swag. There is also an affiliate link for Noble Knight Games in the video description. If you buy stuff through that affiliate link, it helps us support the channel with Noble Knight store credit. Thank you, Noble Knight. Until next time, thanks for watching, and happy gaming.